I'm going to introduce my friend Bob Grant. Bob Grant is a professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. He has 35 years experience with HIV research and clinical care, during which he pioneered in the development of HIV testing treatment and prevention technology. Bob basically developed the drug now that's being used to prevent HIV. In 2014, he shifted his focus to treatment of mental illness and stigma with a curative intent. He completed a certificate in psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy and research at the California Institute of Integral Studies in 2016. He trained in IFS starting in early 2017 and is now an IFS certified therapist. He founded the Healing Realms practice in 2017 which combines IFS with ketamine therapy. He's treated more than 60 clients using this model. And he's a member of the board of directors of the American Society of Ketamine Physicians. And he also has uh, led me on two ketamine journeys, which were profoundly impactful to me. So uh, please help me welcome Bob Grant. Thank you. <laughs> Wow, thank you. It's uh, wonderful to be here, isn't it? And it's wonderful to journey across borders. Uh, just this morning, we were with uh, cultural legacies and burdens, and then into the body, and then into the brain, and now uh, all the time interweaving in our own mind and ourself uh, into this journey. So it's fun to go across borders, and it's fun for me to uh, talk to you about our work on ketamine-assisted IFS therapy. As Dick mentioned, I spent uh, the first um, 30 years of my career working on the HIV epidemic, working on technologies, diagnostics, treatments, and prevention strategies. And those technologies exist, and they're successful. And, but it was in 2014 when I realized that we have all the technology we need to end the HIV epidemic, and yet we don't. And I became curious about why we don't do that. And that's what led me to IFS. It's what led me to mental health. It's what led me back into self and uh, my interest in using IFS and finding ways to uh, facilitate the IFS process. And ketamine is just one of those ways. Uh, what I'll describe to you is based on my clinical practice, uh, which is called Healing Realms. It's ketamine-assisted IFS psychotherapy in San Francisco. Uh, we started in 2017 after about three years of different training programs. It's co-founded with a psychologist named Jessica Katzman, a brilliant and lovely person, also very interested in IFS. We've treated 85 clients so far, uh, depression, suicidality, PTSD, OCD, uh, substance use, and just being stuck, stuck in therapy, stuck in a life transition. Our work is informed by IFS at every step along the way. Uh, we use ketamine by intramuscular injection. It allows us to give either a low dose, which is heart opening or entheogenic, or a higher dose, which is classically psychedelic. We can also use lozenges or intravenous infusions sometimes. How does ketamine work? And, and what, what kinds of hints does it tell us? People who've had a ketamine experience will often say that it's a sensation of being profoundly in self. Uh, the protectors have unblended, the exiles are up um, and accepted. We also know from brain scanning that ketamine lights up a part of the brain, which is in the midline structures. If you put your hands together and your thumbs on your forehead, what's just behind your thumbs is called the anterior cingulate gyrus. And that is a part of the brain that lights up uh, when people are uh, using ketamine. And it's, uh, we, we can relate it to anticipation of future pleasure. And, and activating the ability to anticipate future pleasure is such a key part of treatment of depression. And it's such a key part of being in self as well. It also is uh, a place in the brain that lights up when we're thinking about uh, ourselves, when we represent ourselves to ourselves. Uh, our bodies, our minds. 
And so it's a key part of the brain. It lights up with ketamine. And then uh, during the ketamine episode um, journey, it becomes connected um, through certain kinds of waves uh, to the rest of the brain in a way that's rather unique. Normally, this part of the brain is in a circuit that some people call the default node, mode network. It's uh, associated with ruminations. People come in, they remind you time and time again, every 30 seconds to a minute, uh, about what they believe about themselves. And, um, and you can see this part of the brain being involved in that neural circuit called the default, default mode network um, during ketamine. And I suspect when we do these studies uh, during IFS, uh, what we see is an expansion, and that part of the brain becomes connected with uh, the other parts in a more full and vibrant way. Uh, ketamine is a psychedelic drug. It's our legal psychedelic drug, and uh, it's legit. Um, uh, even the American Psychiatric Association says so. They issued guidance for the use of ketamine for psychiatric disorders in 2017 based on nine randomized cl uh, controlled clinical trials showing that it was highly safe and effective for treatment of mood disorders. A form of ketamine was approved by the FDA uh, for use in depression and suicidality uh, just this year. Advantages of ketamine are that it's a legal psychedelic. Anyone who can prescribe a Schedule III um, a drug can prescribe ketamine. It has a rapid onset of benefit, typically by the end of the session. It alleviates suicidality especially. Um, it's short-acting, low cost. Uh, the generic form of this medication is extremely low cost, costing something like $4 per dose. The whole treatment session cost is driven mainly by therapy time. Um, uh, and there's no need to stop SSRIs or other psychiatric medications because ketamine's acting on a different receptor. It's acting on the glutamate receptor, not the serotonin receptor. And the glutamate receptor is the most abundant receptor in the brain, and it is involved in mood. Now, um, I think it's important to realize that ketamine manifests itself in the world in many different ways at this time. And so um, ketamine practices often use intravenous infusions, and these are often done by anesthesiologists who know the drug from their work in pain and anesthesia. They're using it in a much lower dose when they're treating psychiatric um, conditions. Um, but in these settings of IV infusions, anesthesia staff, there's little privacy, uh, no psychotherapy in practices, and the sessions last a relatively brief period of time of 90 minutes. More and more, we're seeing um, people use lozenges or intranasal ketamine. It is uh, available to the body through these routes. Um, this allows for low-dose sessions, which are heart opening and allow unblending with uh, protectors. Psychotherapy is possible, but it's not always provided in the context of lozenge or nasal sessions. And the, oddly, and, and I was disappointed that the FDA did not require that psychotherapy be offered with ketamine when they approved uh, the particular version of ketamine that they approved uh, this year. These sessions are also relatively short. Our practice uses intramuscular injections. These are shots in the muscle. Uh, and this allows us to give either a low dose or a high dose, depending on what the person needs, or one after the other in the same session, if that's what's called for. And we combine it with psychotherapy from beginning to end. Um, and I'll describe that in more details. And we give ourselves space to actually work with the mind and its systems. Uh, we spend four hours with every client um, as part of our treatment sessions. So I just want to give some caveats and some cautions. Ketamine is not a panacea. Um, practice models vary widely as they're implemented now. It's early days for this field. Um, it's not reimbursed by insurance yet, although the big payers are telling me that they're about a year away from starting to pay and having codes for reimbursement. Um, just a caution that if you have someone with untreated mania, that uh, untreated mania needs to be um, stabilized first before giving them ketamine, otherwise uh, it just gets more activated. Um, it transiently increases blood pressure and pulse, but it's equivalent to moderate exercise. So if someone's exercising, then they can tolerate ketamine as well. It can cause nausea and, vom uh, nausea and headache in some, but it's not like ayahuasca. <laughs> and it's only a, a minority where that happens. And uh, most people get through it by just sitting still for about five or 10 minutes. It rarely can be addictive, but we're not seeing that in our supervised clinical practices. The main limitation of ketamine is, um, is, is that uh, the benefit 
which is very profound. People can have the first days of non-depressed life that they've had in decades, so a profound benefit. Um, but the limitation is that that benefit may only last one to 10 days. Uh, unless ketamine is repeatedly given twice a week for four weeks, or unless it's combined with psychotherapy. And that's how, where we get to IFS. Why I think that IFS is ideal for supporting uh, ketamine practice. Well, IFS is evidence-based, you know that, very well developed over decades. Um, but importantly, it uh, encourages and allows and invites the thinking part to rest. And uh, other psychotherapeutic modalities do the opposite. They actually engage that part. Um, and, and, and that's useful in some settings. In the ketamine setting, uh, resting that part is so beautiful and so important for getting into self and hearing from the exiles. It, uh, ketamine welcomes self qualities, particularly clarity, confidence, and, um, and uh, connection. Uh, it embraces, IFS embraces the multiplicity of the mind, be which becomes uh, very manifest uh, through a ketamine journey. Um, we have parts, and those become very clearly present as ketamine uh, takes its effect. Uh, I love the way IFS uh, encourages and allows and builds skills around continuous consenting. And that's so important when people have taken a medicine that, is, uh, that creates an altered state of consciousness in which their defenses are down. Um, in IFS, we learn how to ask permission to talk, how we ask permission to discuss themes, how we ask permission at every step of the way. And that's so important for people under the influence of ketamine. Uh, and uh, uh, IFS embraces mystical experiences. Uh, it, IFS itself is mind manifesting. And that is the root of the meaning of the word psychedelic. Psychedelic means mind manifesting, and IFS is mind manifesting. So IFS is a psychedelic modality. Um, <laughs> and I've also become convinced in my work that hope is absolutely essential. Um, uh, too often, people who have been suffering for decades are told that um, we can work together and maybe it'll make a little difference for you, but uh, maybe not. And, it, and it'll all depend on how much work you can actually do. And telling someone who's exhausted that that's, um, yeah, that it's just hard. And I love the way IFS really starts with hope. We can do better. We can fix this. We can heal this. And um, people coming into ketamine who believe that they can be healed are healed, and IFS gives us permission to do that and say that. What does mind manifesting mean? Uh, it means becoming aware of parts, yes. <laughs> um, so uh, how does IFS inform our ketamine preparation or preparation for ketamine? Well, it does at the uh, consent phase uh, starting. Uh, we, we generally see people come in, they have a strong managing part who really wants ketamine, and they're not going to let any of their inner parts stand in the way of that mission to get that ketamine in their body. And so uh, they'll sign informed consent, and uh, they don't necessarily offer up any of the concerns that other parts of them have. And so we feel it's really important to have all parts agree before giving someone a psychedelic drug. Um, otherwise, those parts that really didn't get buy-in or didn't have buy-in will come back later and will um, uh, resist and, 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 and meet the violence of the psychedelic um, given without their permission with uh, violence of their own. And this is a, an issue that's only becoming more common since people have read Michael Pollan's book, How Do You Change Your Mind? Uh, they've been very enthused about the notion of ego death and uh, ego dissolution, and we'll see people come in and say, uh, I just want a big dose of ketamine or something so that my ego dies. <laughs> Get rid of that thing. <laughs> it's been in my way, it's been in, my re in the way of my relationships, in the way of my work. I just want that ego to dissolve or die. And, 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 and we use IFS concepts to reframe that discussion and really uh, befriend the ego and to find out what its story is and to encourage it to rest and to see ketamine as an opportunity to rest rather than be exiled from the system. Uh, we also use IFS to, um, to work with the hopeless part. Um, many of our clients are suicidal and that's appropriate because ketamine is so effective for suicidality, and suicidal parts are um, often collaborating with hopeless parts. And so ketamine gives them an opportunity to imagine a different role for themselves, and, and that alone is a healing and beautiful process. We also uh, almost always do an IFS session before giving anyone ketamine, 
And, um, and this builds trust among protectors. It's a move toward unblending. It's used uh, for planning the ketamine dose in a very concrete way. And uh, it gives people an experience of self. And for some, it's the first really time where they've been able to be in self. Um, and that uh, really invites them to go into ketamine uh, with a lot of optimism. There can also be retrieval and unburdening that happens in that IFS session before ketamine. And, and oddly, sometimes the unburdening is held up because they said, no, no, I can't unburden because uh, I need to do that during the ketamine session that's happening next week. <laughs> and so we'll encourage people to unburden when the time is right and that, and that we're, not gonna, we're not gonna withhold ketamine from them just because they've already healed. <laughs> Um, ketamine, uh, we also use IFS on ketamine day, although that, uh, that is evolving in our practice. The session is four hours. Uh, we have two therapists in the room. If there's uh, early attachment trauma, we do that um, so that people can project um, onto either of us. And it also brings more self into the room. And we see this in a very concrete way, because one of us may become distracted or triggered, and the other one will step in and uh, offer self for the ongoing healing process. Um, uh, we have a meditation that we always use that befriends and reassures protectors and invites unblending and spaciousness for exiles to come forward. Uh, at the high, higher dose that we use by intramuscular injection, there is a dissociative phase that lasts about 90 minutes, sometimes only 60. And it's a time where the protectors are resting, um, maybe asleep. And so um, during this time, we leave people uh, to themselves for the most part. Um, it's an inward journey. Uh, later, they'll tell us about abstract images of unburdening. Um, they may float freely into spaciousness. There will be mystical experiences, sometimes ecstatic experiences. Rarely, with ketamine, uh, it can be a difficult journey with profound sadness and despair and pain. And, uh, and I think it's important that people working with these medicines at the higher doses be prepared for holding space for uh, difficult journeys. Um, interestingly, as people come out of those very, most difficult journeys, which again are rare with ketamine, um, they feel better. They feel confidence that they've never had before in their life. And I've become convinced that, that, um, that it's been an exile, that's been very exiled, that's been seen by a self in those journeys, and the self um, was able to see the trauma and not be re-traumatized. And that leaves them after the whole thing with a profound sense of confidence and healing. However, the guide is called on to hold space and to stay with that process, even though it's, it's hard to look at. Uh, and again, that's rare. Most ketamine journeys are, I would say, blissful. Um, 90 minutes we spend for coming back into the body. The protectors come back, still unblended though. Anxiety, depression, and pain return softly. Uh, parts can sit across from each other and, and have conversations. We've had beautiful conversations with people's inner critic or their inner fear and uh, conversations that they've never had before because they've always been so tightly blended with those parts. Um, and uh, sometimes there's, uh, often, uh, there's a retrieval and unburdening during that process. It can often take a very spontaneous form. Um, we also offer light body work focused on parts. And then in the last 30 minutes, we check in with protectors who, toward the end of the session, have come back. And they may have questions and concerns about what just happened. They may think that it's silly or that it doesn't make any sense or that um, whatever was seen was um, maybe unimportant. And so we, we work with them to reassure those parts um, that what happened today was important and the healing is real. The integration is critical for sustaining the benefits of ketamine, which I said before may last only one to 10 days if you don't do integration. And so we use IFS for integration. It starts the day after with a call. We recall events and images, foster inner conversations that started, um, and, and emphasize that what happened during your journey was important. The same kinds of things that you do when you're helping people integrate after an IFS session that's been very profound. We do the same with ketamine. And then people say, well, what's next? And, and we'll often remind them that they made a promise to an exile uh, in the earlier day during the ketamine, and that it's really critical to keep that promise, that that's, uh, that part's a small child, and you don't break promises to small child's children uh, or else they get hurt. And so you know, they may say, well, you know, what's happened next? Should I apply for a job? Should I you know, um, uh, go back to my CBT therapist? And I said, no, no, just you, you promised yesterday that you were gonna look at a photo of yourself every morning. Um, I think that the most important thing for you to do right now is to keep that promise. 
That's very, in, well, that, that is the IFS model. So our outcomes are good. Most people improve after their first session. There's marked reductions in suicidality. Trauma responses are often durable after just one or two sessions. Uh, depression uh, calls for maintenance therapy with ketamine and IFS more frequently. Um, exile retrieval and unburdening can occur. It's, I would say, a significant minority, maybe about a third of, of clients will have a ketamine session where we see the full cycle of exile retrieval and unburdening. When that happens, it uh, predicts a very durable response. Essentially, folks for whom that's happened um, don't really need ketamine again. Sometimes they come back um, just to consolidate the gains and to remind themselves, but um, the profound durable change we see when the whole IFS process is completed. It's unclear to me right now whether the benefits we're seeing are due to ketamine or whether they're due to IFS or due to some synergy between them. Like I said, we've been doing this for just uh, over two years now, and, um, and it's working, and I like that, um, but it's still evolving, and I think we need research to really define um, how much of this is IFS, how much of this is ketamine, and how much is the both of it together. So how does ketamine and other psychedelics assist the IFS process? Uh, ketamine in particular, I think, brings pleasure in being in self. There's been a, a paper that caused some concern that indicated, that proved actually, that ketamine is stimulating the natural endorphin pathway. So it is stimulating the, own, the, the mind's own ability to give pleasure to itself through endorphins. And so there have been concerns that ketamine may be acting just because it's an opiate-like substance. It isn't an opiate, for sure. It's not addictive in that way, but it's stimulating the mind's own opiate system. And yet, I think this all makes sense as giving pleasure of being in self. So it's activating that part of the mind where we can perceive ourselves, and it's giving ourselves pleasure during that time. And so pleasure being in self is a healing process. Fundamentally, you see it during your IFS sessions. I think ketamine is just uh, facilitating that process. Ketamine is allowing unblended protectors to rest, allows for neurogenesis. We know that from animal models. I think psychedelics are, I think all of them are working by inviting in some self-qualities. And as I said before, ketamine in particular brings in clarity and confidence. MDMA, in contrast, which is also in FDA-approved trials now, is the compassion medicine. It really brings in compassion and not so much clarity, frankly. Um, and psilocybin, I call the connection medicine, uh, but again, not always compassionate. Um, so I think it's important that we realize that the client and the therapist are bringing in the other aspects of self, that the self of the client, the self of the therapist is critical in building this balanced experience with self, that the medicine can bring in some of these qualities, but self itself is still absolutely essential in this process. So I just wanted to end by showing a movie of the brain. Um, and going back to the brain, this is... Uh, uh, called Glass Brain. Uh, it's being it's developed uh, based on video game uh, technology uh, by a uh, neuroscientist at UCSF, my home base. And what it does is it uses functional MRI scanning to establish what the connections are in a given person's brain, and then uses EEGs that you heard about from Dr. Huey uh, to identify when signals are going between those parts of the brain. And this is in real time. You can see there in the front, now on the left, that's that part of the brain that's right in the midline that, uh, where we're perceiving ourselves and we're anticipating future pleasure. And you can see a lot, a lot of activity going on. In some moments, it, the whole brain lights up. And I imagine that that's our self becoming in connection and communion with our parts, um, those moments when the, it all lights up. So I do look forward to working with this particular investigator to see what the brain looks like during IFS. Um, I suspect it's going to look a lot like the brain on ketamine, uh, where the whole brain is lit up. So thank you for your attention and for this opportunity. <laughs>